My pastor, now retiring after almost 50 years in ministry, has a wonderful illustrative story about a minister who encountered a woman at the post office who decided to get into an argument about which religion was the true religion, and she engaged in a bit of sophistry, as they often do, claiming that all religions worshipped one God and were like the many roads that led to the post office. But the minister met her challenge with the response that that might be true and a good solution if your problem was just going to the post office. But he didn't plan in his life to just go to the post office. Yet, it has often been said that all roads lead to Rome. And just earmark that thought for now because it might be on the test. According to the Philly Press Review, as of this week and until October 17th, for just $20 ticket price at the Lantern Theater in Center City, just off Market Street, you can regale in the tale of the legend of Robert Johnson, the real-life jazz musician who, they say, acquired his music talent and fame by making a deal with the devil, a man he met at the crossroads in the new production of Me and the Devil. Proper English, that would be the devil and I, but it is drama. And according to that press review, the legend has it that young Robert Johnson, son of an impoverished mother, whose husband had abandoned her, was a struggling blues singer and guitarist scratching out a living in the rural Mississippi. A thoroughly mediocre musician, the young Johnson was once booed off the stage when he appeared between acts of the evening headliners. Humiliated, he slunk off into the night, disappeared for a short time, but then reappeared having acquired a mastery of the blues guitar that had stunned all those who had heard him perform not long before. So how did this musical bumbler go from disaster to a master in such a short time? The legend claims that Johnson set up a rendezvous with the devil at a crossroads one midnight and struck a deal. Johnson offered his immortal soul in exchange for the ability to be the greatest blues artist. So perhaps the real question is just like the commercial used to ask, what would you do for a Klondike bar? Or if you possess a sincerely held faith belief, what profit of man to gain the world but lose his soul? But rather than take a trip to the Gulf Coast to attempt to determine which one of the three possible locations was the place where jazz man Robert Johnson had met a man he called the devil at the crossroads or even to find which one of the graves is truly his grave. And rather than review a story that you might be able to catch on a stage for just $20 in a trip to the city of brotherly love for an evening of mystical fun and good down-home jazz and blues music that even Tim Kaine might be able to crank out for crowds on his harmonica, we're going to take a little mental journey to a town with an identity crisis. Still debating the question as to whether it is in the South along the y'all line where folks prefer to say y'all as opposed to you guys or a part of the Midwest and a tale about a young boxer who began as an amateur at the age of 12 winning a split decision against a local amateur named Ronnie O'Keefe in his 1954 boxing debut and just six years later won a gold medal in the Olympics in Rome. I told you it was going to come back before turning professional in 1960. By 1964 had claimed the heavyweight champion title after defeating Sonny Liston at the age of just 22 and who announced to the world on March 6, 1964 that the youngest man to have ever claimed the title was no longer Cassius Clay but Muhammad Ali. Just three years after a conversion to the Islamic faith affiliated with the black Muslims and the prophet Elijah Muhammad of Chicago. But in 1966, the man they still call the greatest met a man at the crossroads and experienced evolutionary pressures in test of character and faith. After receiving a draft notice for service in the military during the conflict in Southeast Asia and was threatened with five years in prison and stripped of his boxing titles, losing four years of his life as a professional boxer because of his claim that his religious beliefs and ethical oppositions compelled him to evade the draft, a fight he waged in the courts to remain out of prison, and a battle that reached the pinnacle achievement 
of being granted certiorari before the United States Supreme Court. But if you go to look for any of these famous cases, and there are a few of them that finally get us there, you will not find an accused defendant named Muhammad Ali, but rather the name with which he was born, Cassius Marcellus Clay. And like the folks at Conway Regional Health System in Arkansas who believed that a pandemic crisis was a good time to educate their employees and test their sincerity, or at least the 5% who would claim their religious exemption to avoid a vaccine mandate, the law enforcement authorities and the draft board enforcing the draft for the conflict in the jungles of Laos and Vietnam felt it necessary to test the faith convictions of a boxing legend who achieved fame and fortune, who had fought Joe, Joe Frazier in the thriller in Manila, who had fought George Foreman in the rumble in the jungle that was viewed by a worldwide audience of over one billion to become the world's most watched live television broadcast at that time and was the first in boxing history to claim the heavyweight title three times. But 1966 was not the first time for the greatest to face the draft. He had voluntarily registered for conscription on his 18th birthday in 1962 and was listed as 1A, fit for conscription in the service in the military. Two years later in 1964, Ali was reclassified as 1Y fit for service only in times of national emergency after scoring a substandard aptitude in writing and spelling and failing the U.S. Armed Forces qualifying test with a medical reason stated as dyslexia, which elicited the response from the usually boastful, trash-talking political poet that I said I was the greatest, not the smartest. But when the Army lowered its standards in 1966, Ali got smart as Einstein enough to go over to the crossroads to find him a good attorney. The radical opposition to the war certainly placed Ali at odds with the establishment, but also won him increasing support in the anti-war movement, with whom he joined forces during his hiatus from his boxing career. Among personalities like Jane Fonda, a good friend of Congressman Don Byers, and faced with the evolutionary pressure after having won six Kentucky Gold Glove titles, two National Golden Glove titles, an Amateur Athletic Union National title, and the light heavyweight gold medal in the 1960 Summer Olympics in Rome, an amateur career that had 100 wins and only five losses. What would you do or say to save your career? And what would you do to avoid the possibility of losing your life in the jungles of Vietnam and Laos. What if you were a poor black boy born in Louisville? Gordon Gecko said, give him to me poor and hungry. And when you get into a little trouble with the law, you have to be very careful in your vulnerable position about those things that you might say that may go against what you learned in Sunday school, but also about those friends who are all too willing to come to your rescue and aid. And Ali believed he had a good friend in the prophet Elijah Muhammad of Chicago, who decided to help out his court troubles by ordaining him as a minister. But when brought to the crossroads in his life that had voluntarily registered for the draft, that had voluntarily taken the test for military service, that had on all evidence, at least in record, failed to qualify the second time because of the medical exemption of dyslexia, the draft board found unworthy of credence his claims that he had no conflict with the Viet Cong, that the conflict was not a jihad sanctioned by his faith, that he was a minister newly ordained at all, or that he was a conscientious objector. And that matter was argued all the way up to the United States Supreme Court to test in part the relevant question as to whether Muhammad Ali who had even changed his name from Cassius Clay, held a sincerely held faith belief, a name they would not even put on the court record. And at least before the current public health crisis, so many progressives believe that that was so unfair that they even produced a movie about it on HBO after a blockbuster film about the rumble in the jungle starring the actor Will Smith. And in that decision, the Supreme Court, in a pure per curion decision, with Justice Thurgood Marshall, the only black justice on the court abstaining from taking part, stated 
In order to qualify for classification as a conscientious objector, a registrant must satisfy three basic tests. He must show that he is conscientiously opposed to war in any form. He must show that this opposition is based upon religious training and belief as the term has been construed in our decisions. And he must show that this objection is sincere. In applying these tests, the selective service system must be concerned with the registrant as an individual, not with its own interpretation of the dogma of the religious sect, if any, to which he may belong. I say again, because it is worth repeating in a contentious environment where there is much emphasis on religious tests properly applied. In applying these tests, the selective service system must be concerned with the registrant as an individual, not as a group, not with its own interpretation of the dogma of the religious sect, if any, to which he may belong. So I'm thinking that coming up with a list of medications that your company believes you should not be taking may be outside that range. And it is of note that presented with their own evolutionary pressure, the government that had brought the case against a man identified by the court as only Cassius Clay, denying him even his religious name, decided not to further contest that sincerely held faith belief of a man who won a gold medal in the 1960 Olympics in Rome. But as we shall see later, this was only the beginning in tests of faith. As Paul writes in his epistle to the early church at Ephesus, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. To those in faith, behold, for you are sent forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And I charge thee, therefore, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For a time has come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they keep to themselves teachers having itching ears, having itching ears. And they turn away their ears from the truth and are turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Live long and prosper, Star Voyagers. This briefing is unclassified. As you were. My name is Major Mike Webb, and by God, I am running for Arlington Public School Board. Let's keep Mike Webb away from our schools. Honest. Carry on. This advertisement was authorized by Mike Webb. I used to be a Power Ranger in a former life. Thunk, I could have had a vaccine.